In an earlier video, I showed evidence that LPS, also known as lipopolysaccharide, or endotoxin, increases CD38 expression. And I also showed data that CR, calorie restriction, can reduce LPS, which uh, introduces a hypothesis that uh, one of the reasons that CR may uh, result in increased NAD levels is because of its effect on reducing LPS. Now that's one intervention that can reduce LPS. Are there other interventions that can also reduce it with the goal of maximizing NAD production? So I'm going to talk about that in a few slides, but before we get there it's important to just do a quick review because it's going to be uh, important to the discussion uh, in a slide or two. So first, uh, uh, levels of LPS increase during aging, and that's been shown on, in the left, in mice, and in people. And again, if you want more of a, a review of this topic, I'll link the uh, previous video in the right corner. Now, the age-related increase in LPS is important, again, as I mentioned, because CD38 gene expression in macrophages is increased up to sevenfold, as shown here, um, uh, in the presence of LPS. And also, uh, when macrophages are exposed to LPS, they don't just increase gene expression within macrophages, they release C CD38 uh, into the external environment. So that potentially would indicate an increase in circulating CD38 to uh, uh, negatively impact NED levels uh, systemically. Not a good thing. So where is this LPS coming from? How did it get there? And then what can we do to reduce it? So I showed this data in that previous video too, but I'm going to add a little bit more uh, information uh, that will lead us into the story for this video. So lipopolysaccharides found in the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria, and that's what's shown here. And so there's the outer membrane, and then you can see uh, lipopolysaccharide as the metabolite sticking out from the outer membrane. Now, what I didn't show and highlight in the last video is that um, in the proportion of the LPS molecule, I've highlighted two phosphates that are found in its lipid A portion. And this is important because I'm going to introduce a protein later on that takes those uh, phosphates off, that dephosphorylates it, which detoxifies LPS. So uh, that data is coming in a little bit. So when considering that LPS increases during aging and that LPS is found in the outer wall of gram-negative bacteria, um, does that mean that the LPS that's in the blood, is that coming from an increased amount of blood bacteria? And in, in part, there is evidence to support that hypothesis. So what we're looking at here is the incidence of E. coli uh, bacteremia, which means the presence of E. coli bacteria in the blood as a function of age. So first, what we can see is that the incidence of having E. coli found in the blood is very high for babies, 0 to 1 years old. And then it dramatically decreases uh, you know, up till about 15 to 24 years. But then when comparing that age group with 25 to 49 year olds, we can see that 25 to 49 year olds have about a double incidence of having E. coli in the blood. But even worse than that is that 74 year olds or older have about a 10 times higher incidence of having E. coli bacteria in the blood compared to the 25 to 49 year olds. So there's definitely an increase in LPS containing E. coli in the blood during aging. So where did it come from? How's it How's it getting into the blood? Well, one possibility is that it's coming from the intestine. And intestinal levels of E. coli increase during aging, which would make sense uh, based on the blood E. coli data. So what we're looking at uh, here is E. coli abundance in the intestine as a function of age. So in younger than 20-year-olds, uh, E. coli levels range, intestinal E. coli levels range from about 8 to 10 percent that then decrease uh, a little bit uh, to uh, until you get to about 40 to 49 years old where it's more tightly around 8%, seven-ish to 8%. But then you can also see that the E. coli levels then dramatically increase such that uh, 80, people who are over the age of 80 have E. coli levels that are 12 to 14% of the total uh, bacterial amount in the intestine. So a six, around a 6% increase in E. coli levels in the blood, uh, sorry, in the intestine. So um, I didn't show some of this data in, that I just wrote down here, but during aging there's an obviously which I showed, there's an increased intestinal amount of LPS containing bacteria, but there's also decreased barrier function. I didn't get into that, but the decreased barrier function would then uh, be an explanation why there would be an increase of LPS containing E. coli in the blood. So is there a way to reduce intestinal E. coli levels to improve gut barrier function and also to detoxify LPS? And remember the end game here is uh, reducing LPS so that we can reduce CD38 expression to maximize NAD and, and boost health, health span and lifespan and all the good things that come with that. So uh, I'm going to introduce a protein here and that's intestinal alkaline phosphatase. Uh, and that protein is found obviously in the intestine as its name says and it's been shown to detoxify LPS. Now how it detoxifies LPS is 
partly encoded in its name. It's a phosphatase. So if you remember a couple of slides ago, I introduced that uh, LPS has uh, phosphate groups in its lipid A core that uh, L uh, this protein, IAP, dephosph dephosphorylates and removes them, thereby reducing LPS's activity. So that's what we see here in this picture. So starting from the top of it, uh, with the luminal microflora, that's the microbiome contained in, in your stool. And some of the bacteria in that mi uh, microflora have LPS, and then you can see the phosphate groups in, in yellow that are attached, and then the IAP that's in green dephosphorylates those uh, phosphate groups on LPS and removes them. And that's what you can see with the LPS with its free phosphate groups. Now, that's important because on the left side, we see LPS intact, that's intact. And when it's intact, it binds to its receptor, in this case, intestinal epithelial cells. Uh, its receptor is called TLR, toll-like receptor. And when LPS binds to the TLR receptor, actually in any cell, not just intestinal epithelial cells, it, it's, it signals a pro-inflammatory cascade. Inflammation is bad. It's, it, I don't have to explain it in this, is this video. Uh, you know, everybody knows having too much inflammation is bad. It increases during aging. So in contrast, when IAP, intestinal alkaline phosphatase, dephosphorylates LPS, that detoxifies it, and LPS can no longer bind to TLR, uh, its TLR receptor, uh, to stimulate that pro-inflammatory cascade. So IAP is good for potentially reducing inflammation based on this, uh, you know, this uh, data. So while that seems like IAP would be very important in this LPS story, however, intestinal levels of IAP, IAP decrease during aging, and that's what's shown here in human data. So this is actually IAP in intestinal contents uh, as a function of age. That's what's plotted. And we can very clearly see that someone in their 30s with values around 0.4 uh, are reduced to about half, 0.2, to someone that's 70. So there, you know, aging induces a decreased IAP activity. And that's got functional consequences. So in this case, this is data in mice, and this is a frailty in index data uh, as a function of age. So they, they looked at frailty in four, 12, and 21-month-old mice. Uh, so, so what did they compare? So they compared frailty in wild-type animals who have IAP, and then they knocked it out, which would basically simulate the aging condition where it's dramatically decreased. So it, it didn't do anything in the four-month-old mice. This is essentially you know, a tenth, uh, you know, f uh, maximum mouse lifespan is about 40 months. That's not on CR, just a normal lifespan. So four divided by 40 months is one-tenth of, of the lifespan, which in human years would be about a, a teenager, a 12-year-old. So, uh, but there was no effect uh, you know, when comparing uh, having less IAP on frailty in young mice. However, in the 12 and 21-month-old mice, we can see that not having IAP, the mice were more frail, significantly more frail when compared with the animals that had uh, IAP at both ages. So not having IAP obviously will uh, induce frailty in the mice, but what about having more IAP? If this hypothesis of IAP having anything to do with health is true, we'd expect to see opposite effects if you add more of it in. So that's what they did, and again, this is the, uh, again in mice, and what we can see is in animals that were treated with IAP uh, that were 18 months old and 21 months old, we can see that the animals treated with IAP, and this is wild type animals, not the knockout animals, so give the normal mice more IAP, and the blue bars show that they were less frail at both 18 and 21, 21 months of age. So um, functionally, IEP is important, but more important, I, I, or, or equally to some uh, important, is lifespan. What effect did, does IEP have on lifespan? So that's what we see here, survival plotted against age. And again, this is mouse data. So they compared the normal lifespan with the black line versus IEP knockout mice, which do not have uh, intestinal alkaline phosphatase, and uh, they also compared supplementing the mice with IAP. And the mice that didn't have IAP lived significantly shorter, you can see that with the red line, and in contrast, the animals that were supplement supplemented with IAP had both an increased average and maximal lifespan. So we could argue, based on this data, that IAP is important for both health and longevity. So with all that, to consider which interventions uh, increase IAP. So first, uh, omega-3 fatty acids uh, have been shown to increase uh, intestinal levels of alkaline phosphatase. So what they did in this study was they uh, used transgenic animals that would have an, in an increased omega-3 level in tissues, which then would reduce the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. But they also did experiments directly supplementing the animals with fish oil. So the omega-3 in this case would refer to fish oil. So what happened <clears throat> when they had 
uh, higher levels of omega-3 in tissues and a lower omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. Well, it induced changes in the gut microbiome, and we can see that here. IAP, IAP levels increased, E. coli levels, which again contain LPS, decreased. Correspondingly, levels of intestinal LPS decreased. Uh, I didn't box it, but gut permeability also decreased. And the net effect of those changes were uh, decreased levels of LPS in the blood, which would be good, again, with the CD8 story because less LPS, potentially less CD38, potentially more NAD, and all the good stuff that would come from that. Now, they also did experiments uh, inhibiting IEP to, to look at its contribution to uh, its ability to affect the gut microbiome composition and its ability to affect circulating levels of LPS and gut permeability and found that it was, it, you know, while omega-3 induced IEP, it was IEP that was driving the changes in less E. coli, less LPS, less gut, gut, gut permeability, and also less circulating LPS. Now, uh, also, just to play this forward on, on this uh, picture a little bit more, again, so with less circulating LPS, that uh, 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 there's less of it that binds to TLR4 and then less of the intracellular uh, signaling cascade that activates uh, pro-inflammatory uh, 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 gene expression or uh, you know, and actually protein levels of TNF-alpha, IL-6, and IL-1-beta, which are pro-inflammatory molecules. So uh, omega-3 and the IAP story would be good potentially not just for, the, for NAD, but also for reducing uh, systemic levels of inflammation. So what about other interventions? Uh, well, another intervention that increases IEP is potentially a high soluble fiber diet. So not all fiber is the same. Fiber is comprised of insoluble fiber, which is not fermented by gut bacteria, and soluble fiber, which is fermented by gut bacteria into the short chain fatty acids here. Uh, acetate, C2, two carbon fatty acid, propionate, C3, a three carbon fatty acid, and butyrate, C4, a four carbon fatty acid. And why those are uh, fatty acids, those short chain fatty acids are important is because <clears throat> when colonic epithelial cells are exposed to short chain fatty acids, in this case, they also, besides using C2, C3, C4, uh, they also did C5 and C6, so five and six carbon fatty acids. So um, when adding short chain fatty acids and looking at uh, IAP gene expression uh, compared to actin, a, a loading control, they found that uh, highest levels of IAP were induced by butyrate, C4. So when considering that butyrate is increased by a high fiber diet, one could posit that eating a high fiber diet would also increase IAP levels in the intestine. Now, those on a, on a ketogenic uh, diet could also make a similar argument because uh, with a high fat ketogenic diet, you're gonna have an increase in uh, fatty acid oxidation and that fat increase in fatty, fatty acid oxidation should lead to an increase in acetate. Acetate is a C2, uh, short chain fatty acid, as I mentioned here, but then acetate is also, it can, it can also be combined into butyrate. So, um, but I looked for more direct evidence for a ketogenic diet on increasing short chain fatty acid levels, and I didn't find any RCTs on that. So that's purely a hypothesis, whereas a high soluble fiber diet has been uh, well published, well known, it's well known to increase, uh, you know, intestinal levels of short chain fatty acids. Now, last, uh, vitamin K has been shown to increase intestinal levels of uh, alkaline phosphatase. So uh, what we're looking at here is both K1 and K2 were uh, given to rats, and then their levels of intestinal phosphatase activity, uh, IAP, were compared against controls or control-fed animals. So in the duodenum, uh, we can see that K1 resulted in increased IAP activity relative to control, but K2 did not. However, in the jejunum, uh, both vitamin K1 and vitamin K2 increased IEP activity when, conf when compared to uh, animals that were not supplemented with uh, either of the vitamin K uh, isoforms. So it's also important to note that the rats were fed in this study uh, 600 milligrams of vitamin K1 or K2 per kilogram of food uh, and that the animals also ate 15 to 16 grams of food per day. So when you crunch the numbers there and consider that the, uh, the body size conversion for rats to humans is divided by six, the equivalent human dose to get this boost in IAP activity would be at about 1,500 micrograms of vitamin K1 uh, per day, just as an example. And I didn't include this in my K1 video. I'll link to the K1 video for those that are interested in the right corner here. But one reason why I shoot for the 1,500 micrograms of K1 per day, which is dramatically higher than the adequate intake of about 100 or so micrograms per day, is in part because of this data. So just as a quick summary, 
if we increase IAP with diet, one would expect less LPS, and when considering the association between LPS and CD38, that potentially would result in more NAD. Now, the last half of this, uh, of, of this hypothesis has not been tested. I look for evidence, uh, published evidence for IEP and NED levels, and it hasn't been tested yet. But based on everything I've shown you so far, it, it seems like a pretty low risk approach to change it with diet with the potential uh, high benefit of improving NAD levels. And that's all I've got. Uh, you can find me lots of places online. Have a great day.